Welcome to the History Guy podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at the History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and the History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join the History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with the History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, the History Guy tells two stories of the space race and NASA's efforts to better understand our solar system and the universe. First, he tells the story of Pioneer 10, the first spacecraft to pass through the asteroid belt and the first human-made device sent to study the outer solar system up close. Then he tells the remarkable story of Voyager 2 and the incredible journey it took to examine the furthest planets in our solar system. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. It is June 13th, 2018, the 35th anniversary of a seminal event in human history. While it's little known and surprisingly forgotten, the event is a testament to human ingenuity, to human curiosity, to the human need to know where we fit into the vast cosmos. 35 years ago today, on June 13th, 1983, a plucky 569-pound champion that had already amassed an impressive string of firsts and was operating well beyond its life expectancy became the first man-made object to travel beyond the orbit of the outer planets of our solar system and head into the vast unknown. The journey of Pioneer 10 deserves to be remembered. The Pioneer program was a series of United States lunar and deep space probes launched between 1958 and 1978. Pioneer 4, launched in March of 1959, was the first U.S. probe to achieve escape velocity and successfully escape the Earth's gravity. A year later, Pioneer 5 investigated interplanetary space between the orbits of Earth and Venus, where it, among other accomplishments, confirmed the existence of planetary magnetic fields. Pioneers 6, 7, 8, and 9, launched between 1965 and 1968, represented a new generation of vehicles that were a series of solar orbiting satellites designed to obtain measurements of interplanetary phenomena to make the first detailed comprehensive measurements of the solar wind, solar magnetic field, and cosmic rays. The vehicles also acted as the world's first space-based solar weather network, providing practical data on solar storms which impact communications and power on Earth. The highly successful program has been touted as one of the least expensive of all NASA spacecraft programs in terms of scientific results per dollar spent. During the same period that they were launching Pioneers 6 through 9, NASA had been studying a concept for a space probe that they were calling the Galactic Jupiter Probe, or the Advanced Planetary Probe, that would study the solar, interplanetary, and galactic phenomena in the outer region of our solar system. NASA put together a proposal for a pair of probes that was approved in 1969, right at the heyday of the Apollo program. The two probes would be called Pioneer 10 and 11. The mission objectives were to explore the interplanetary medium past the orbit of Mars, study the asteroid belt and assess the possible hazard to spacecraft traveling through the belt, and explore Jupiter and its environment. These would be groundbreaking missions that would provide information critical to further deep space exploration. It was a tall order to develop a vehicle that was supposed to do many things no probe had ever done. The window to send a probe to Jupiter, when the relative positions of Earth and Jupiter permit such a launch at minimal energy, only occurs about every 13 months. As the missions were intended to lead the way for more planetary exploration later in the 1970s, the launch window for the first probe was set for 1972. That was a very brief time frame to design and build the craft. Moreover, the launch vehicle, an Atlas Centaur, set the upper limit for the vehicle's mass, which was not large, somewhere in the 550-pound range. Several steps were taken to help speed the program development. The project was assigned to NASA's Ames Research Center, which had experience with spin-stabilized craft, under the direction of Pioneer Program Manager Charlie Hall. The contract was given without a competitive bid, a choice that cut months out of the process, to TRW, which had built the Pioneer 6-9 vehicles. Basic design concepts followed a mantra of faster, better, cheaper. 
Whenever possible, the vehicle used modules and systems that were already tested, with most scientific modules based on the previous Pioneer designs. Redundancy was built into vital systems, with the craft designed to switch automatically to a backup should a primary system fail. A team of some of the world's best scientists winnowed down the options for experiments and instruments. In the era before microprocessors and integrated circuits, a true onboard computing system would have been both too heavy and needed too much power. A very simple processor that could store up to five commands directed the craft's operation, but most computations would be done on Earth. This simplified the design, but required that mission operators prepare commands long in advance of transmitting them to the probe. A particular challenge was power. The previous probes had all traveled roughly within the orbit of Mars, meaning they could get ample power from solar panels. But Pioneer 10 and 11 would be headed to Jupiter, where the Sun produced 1 27th the light it does on Earth. That would require large and delicate solar panels. The answer was radioisotope thermoelectric generators. These devices generated electricity from thermocouples using the heat provided by small capsules of decaying plutonium-239, referred to as Systems for Nuclear Auxiliary Power, or SNAP. Such generators were generally considered unreliable for long-term use at the time. But the Atomic Energy Commission and the Teledyne Corporation had just designed a new version called the SNAP-19. In fact, they were anxious themselves to use the new design, and so covered the cost of building the prototypes. Four SNAP-19 RTGs provided the power, placed at the ends of 10-foot booms to reduce the effect of the residual radiation of the devices on the probe's scientific instruments. The end result was an extraordinary design. Simple, durable, well-tested, yet elegant. But one more detail still had to be added. Eric Burgess, a journalist writing about the program, suggested to famed astronomer Carl Sagan that the spacecraft, which, if successful, would be the first to achieve escape velocity from the Earth's solar system, should include a message from mankind to any intelligent extraterrestrial life it might encounter. The result was the famed Pioneer plaque, designed by Sagan and astrophysicist Frank Drake. The 9-inch by 6-inch gold anodized aluminum plaque included figures of a man and woman, and diagrams that would provide intelligent life with information about the origin of the spacecraft including the location of the Sun relative to the center of the galaxy and several known pulsars. Launched on March 3, 1972, Pioneer 10 passed the Moon just 11 hours from launch, making it the fastest human-made object ever at the time. On July 15, 1972, it became the first spacecraft to enter the asteroid belt, located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. No one knew what to expect. While NASA was confident the craft would miss any large objects, at the probe's velocity, a rock the size of a baseball would easily destroy Pioneer 10. The ship found that there were fewer particles than expected and passed through the belt safely, emerging in February of 1973. While its scientific instruments continued to gather data on the interplanetary environment, Pioneer 10 was now on the way to its primary target, the planet Jupiter. Jupiter has lethal radiation belts, and no one really knew what the effect would be. It might fry the tiny probe and all its scientific instruments. The craft did not have an actual camera. As Pioneer 10 passed by Jupiter and its moons in November, an instrument called an imaging photopolarimeter, which is used to measure an angle of rotation caused by passing polarized light through an optically active substance, measured the strength of sunlight scattered from the clouds of Jupiter and converted the information into digital representations of different shades of red and blue. With the aid of computers, scientists converted these signals into patterns of light and dark on a photographic film, making unique pictures of Jupiter and its moons that were displayed in real time. The pictures were so spectacular that the Pioneer Project won an Emmy Award for their presentation. Pioneer 10 had done its job, and as it slingshotted past Jupiter into deep space, the huge amount of data it provided was being analyzed to help refine the mission of its twin, Pioneer 11, already passing through the belt on its way to pass both Jupiter and Saturn. Pioneer 10's primary mission was completed, but the little probe that could wasn't finished yet. NASA extended its mission, hoping that its instruments could identify the heliopause, the, the boundary that marked the end of the Sun's influence, the true outer edge of our solar system. It passed through the orbit of Saturn in 1976 and Uranus in 1979. On June 13, 1983, 11 years after launch and a decade after accomplishing its primary mission of exploring Jupiter, the craft crossed the outer orbit of Neptune, at the time the outermost planet, and so became the first human-made object to leave the proximity of the major planets of our solar system. It was still loyally gathering and broadcasting data. 
1995, the RTGs of its twin, Pioneer 11, which had done spectacular flybys of Jupiter and Saturn, gave out. But Pioneer 10, well, pioneered on. NASA first tried to shut the program down in 1997, but the probe was still going, 25 years after launch. Diehards with the project managed to keep the program's life extended, first as a tool for deep space tracking exercise, and then as a test subject for a NASA study on weak signals. The craft, still going, was so old that the project managers had to keep an antique DEC PDP-1114 computer operating to send and receive commands. The last successful reception of telemetry from Pioneer 10 came April 27th of 2002, and the last very weak signal came January 23rd of 2003. NASA assumes that the RTGs are no longer producing enough power to operate the transmitter. At the time, the probe was some 12 billion kilometers away from Earth and had been loyally broadcasting from space for more than 30 years. And astoundingly, Pioneer 10 still had one more contribution to make. Pioneers 10 and 11 had, for reasons no one could explain, traveled some 3,000 kilometers per year less than they were predicted to have. The unexplained phenomenon suggested the possibility of some new physical principle. The mystery was called the Pioneer Anomaly. Only by reviewing the decades-old telemetry data from Pioneer 10 and 11 were scientists, in 2012, able to answer the question that heat from electrical currents in the craft was pushing back on the probes, causing them to decelerate slightly. Thus, the plucky Pioneer 10 made a last contribution to science 40 years after it was launched. Pioneer 10 led the way for the deep space missions that followed. Voyager 1, launched in 1977, is faster and has now gone farther than Pioneer 10 and was the first to cross the heliopause in August of 2012. Pioneer 10 was the first man-made object to go beyond Mars, the first to go through the asteroid belt, the first to swing by Jupiter, and 35 years ago today, the first man-made object to pass beyond the orbits of the major planets of our solar system. It deserves to be remembered. Now is the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. And we'd also like to welcome back Betty Jo, my grandmother and mother of the history guy. So I've always loved space, and of course uh, you, you, the history guy, has always loved science fiction with me. I think it's part of how where I got my love for science fiction. And while this is science fact, I think it's kind of a place where you know history and this love for science and science fiction gets to gets to interact. Well, yeah, I mean, science fiction is often inspired by pieces of history like this, and uh, history is inspired by science. How many uh, astronomers today and people scientists today were inspired by Star Trek? So, yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, the two do intersect. But it's it's interesting because when you think of space, you think of it as being sort of future. Uh, but I mean, definitely, this is history, and it's really an interesting history. And each of these, uh, each of these missions was tied up in the culture and the economics and the politics uh, of the time in in very unique ways. Uh, and they all, you know, they build on each other like any other historical event. So I really do enjoy telling these stories because uh, we kind of, we, we, I guess, we most people tend to see this, you know, the the whole idea of space exploration kind of as a whole. But I mean, each of these little missions having their well, not little. I mean, gosh. <laughs> significant important missions uh, has their own story behind them and, and almost like each of these has a personality and that's that's yeah. the real fun stories to tell and the most important thing to me as I watch these again and think about it is who in the world would have ever dreamed how who in the world were the people that figured all that out uh, and and you still when people say you know I don't even believe we went to the moon you kind of almost could understand them because my goodness gracious, the technology and and uh, and when that was all developed is just astonishing. It's astonishing, and uh, usually under constraints. Yeah, uh, and you know it's interesting because one of the one of the comments in there actually from the program director was that they, their their motto was was better, faster, cheaper, and you know the the general belief, the general dogma out there is that you can only have two, but you can never have three. Uh, but they figured out how to have three. They figured out the way to do yeah. that, and that's really it's really kind of you know it's, that those are just interesting stories, and the, the, you know the people behind them have such passion for them that even after these things have completed their missions, you know they're still fighting to keep the mission alive because it's still alive out there and it's still talking yeah. to them, and they don't you know they don't want it to be out there screaming and have no one hear it. You know, yeah, oh, it's it's incredible what what we can do with these. I mean these tiny little metal machines, and you know they're large. Yeah. They're usually fairly large compared to us. As humans, yeah. but you know, you send them out in space. Compared space. To space. 
<laughs> these are yeah, smaller than almost anything out there. Yeah, what, we actually out. think someone's going to find that little plaque or find one of those records. Yeah. That, that would be absolutely extraordinary. Uh, you know, but I mean, you know, we put them on there. The reason we put them on there, I mean, that's that's politics or life too. And it yeah. is kind of funny that what we, the first thing we want to say to Alien Life is here's here's naked pictures of us and where you find our house. They might, <laughs> I, I don't know really what they're going to think of us. Or, you know, an LP, like they're, oh, you know, I happen to have an Edison photograph right here in my spaceship. I wonder if they could figure out, well, does it, it might actually have a player there on, I don't, I can't remember if it, if you can actually play it using what they've got there. Because uh, oh, yes, otherwise, yeah. yeah, how do you even figure out how to play the record? That's, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, they were doing their best to do something that they hoped that something intelligent enough to know what this is would be intelligent enough to be yeah. able to figure that out. And the location of the Earth is based on pulsars that they think that, you know, that they would be able to identify. So it's, you know, there's a whole lot of thought. Of course, those were yeah. made by, you know, top in scientists, a whole lot of thought behind it. But, uh, you know, the real thought behind it is to say that, you know, that the odds that something this size would get picked out of space uh, are so minuscule, and yet we still, you know, we still feel yeah. this need to to uh, 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 or to hope that that will be a connection to something else. We don't want to feel like we're alone, you know. Well, and it's interesting, That's... you know, we sent those out, and uh, what the Voyager, the Voyager missions, and several of the Pioneer ten and eleven are flying out into space, and will continue to do so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, one, one and two, and, and ten and eleven are both now beyond the heliosphere, right? And they're on, yeah. so they're in, they're in the great unknown. And they'll continue to, I mean, gosh, they might continue to fly around in space long after human yeah. civilization ends. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, you know, you get you throw the baseball in space, it's going to go on forever. So maybe, you know, maybe those will have gone, and, you know, in terms of space, the distance won't be that much. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, billions and billions of kilometers away from here, yeah. uh, and, you know, when someone finds it, we might be long gone, you know. I mean, the whole, this whole solar system might have been, you know, cooked in a, in a, yeah, you know, Nova or something like that. Who so, knows? Yeah, right? it is. It is interesting uh, because it, you know, they're uh, they're slowly their RTGs will degrade, but I mean, the yeah. you know, the metal and et cetera out there will will deteriorate very little in space. Yeah, uh, you know, unless, until, they, know, run unless they run into something. Yeah, but the chances are rather small that they'll that they'll do yeah, that anytime yeah. soon. <laughs> so they made it through the asteroid belt, so you think they can make it through the uh, you know the space between solar systems. Yeah, and but, you know, uh, yeah, I feel... so there, it's fascinating. It says, yeah. I mean, it says so much about us that we're interested in, that we're willing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on it, uh, and uh, you know, the the scientific value of it uh, in in terms of understanding the universe might be huge. But I mean, that's you know, there's a, there's a point where now it's just an interest to say that we made something and we yeah. we could put it out that that's how far we can reach. It's how how far our voice goes. Yeah, you and know, to put it all into perspective, I always I have to do this. My grandmother. Uh, came from Arkansas, went to Colorado in a covered wagon. Uh, she brought, she was, she had a, a baby in her arms and, and, and another one in her belly, and here she was. And she actually flew to Europe on a jet plane, and she actually saw a man go to the moon. And if you think about those years, uh, you know, I know now with technology and such, we've done marvelous things, but think about what man did during yeah. those times. It's just yeah. on, absolutely astonishing. Yeah. That shift from literally, you know, moving in covered wagons, uh, things pulled by horses, yeah. to we we to sent we, a rocket. We made something that is now beyond the the, the yeah. pull of the sun. I mean, that's, yeah. that's literally gone outside the solar system. That's just it's so hard to imagine. Yeah, you know, and I think that the 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 pioneer missions, especially, I mean, there are lots of missions, and I think a lot of them end up being kind of obscure. But it's yeah. interesting because every one of them yeah, was, I can, I was do so an important. episode on every pioneer mission because yeah. they were all unique and interesting in themselves. Uh, and you know, ten and eleven are very different than one through nine, uh, but they all did really, really kind of fascinating things. And some of them, I mean, some of them we're still using to monitor like uh, uh, solar wind and space weather and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, but, I mean, we've done a lot. I mean, we could have done a lot more of these on probes because we've done them for, for the history guy. Uh, and the, each, of the, you know, again, each mission is interesting. And there's, yeah. there's many more to do. I think we'll have a lot more of those NASA-oriented missions out there. Though I did, uh, you know, we have friends at NASA, and we've been, we work with NASA on, on a, you know, now and again. Uh, and I did kind of promise that we would uh, focus some on the aeronautics part because we've, we've always wanted to talk about the space part. Yeah. Uh, and NASA does lots of things other than send space probes out, too. But, uh, uh, but I mean, each of these probably, you know, again, they're 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 like a fascinating personality, each and every yeah. one of them, and they're and they all, you know, advanced our understanding of things in in some way, you know. Yeah, and I I think that I mean I think it's good for us to remember some of this stuff. I think about you know the Pioneer Ten was the first one through the asteroid belt, and I, I don't know, mm -hmm. I hadn't really thought about 
when that happened. And yeah. I think that very few people, if you ask them, would know what we did. First I mean, it, went you know, we were really not belt. sure if it was possible to send anything to say Mars because it, if would it, would it be destroyed in the asteroid belt? Yeah. Uh, and now we've you know we've popped quite a few things through there, and you know they're literally talking about manned missions to Mars and stuff like that. I mean, that, yeah. you know, couldn't do that without that. So you're, uh, you, as much as people understand the space program, and 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 you know a lot of times the mission that you remember is the one that when you were that specific age where yeah. you were. You were most thinking about that, and, but uh, uh, it, you know how each of them accomplished what they accomplished. When you when you go back and look at that, it is really a fascinating history. Yeah, I think it was amazing that they won an Emmy. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not something well, I mean, you usually was, think you know, about. And the, how they put together that you know that movie too was interesting. Yeah. I mean, how you how you made a, a you know a program out of that Incredible, because they had yeah. a, you know it wasn't really built to be a film camera, but they they they, they turned it into a yeah. I mean, how can you not how can you not say that that is a tech, technical accomplishment beyond anything that the television arts and sciences had managed to that point? You know, it didn't even have you know it didn't even have a camera on it, and they're able to. I mean, they made these are famous images that they uh -huh. that they were. Were able to put together using essentially telemetry data and that's uh -huh. that's just incredible i mean this and that was closer you know that was close to a, a celestial body that man has stared at for all of yeah. human history and that we had never and we sent something to go look at it i mean that's that's amazing yeah and that, yeah well and that you know that whole story shows how again you know the people that did this i mean they they had to you know in each of these cases they had to uh, you know they had to improvise yeah, uh, in extraordinary ways, so that these are, I mean, these are truly geniuses that understood these and made these amazing things that went that distance. But I mean, when you, when you're like, you know, we've got to do something it wasn't built to do, or we've got to get it to do something even though a part's not working, and you know, they still figure that out. It's just, you know, it's absolutely extraordinary. And, you yeah. know, in we might not remember their names as well, but the people that did these probes are as important to, in, in history as anybody else whose name we remember from that period historically. And you know might contribute more to the long run understanding that you know that builds humanity than you know than someone who was a president or a yeah. premier or a general or something during the same era. These are the you know this information that they collected with these these tiny machines that we launched into mm -hmm. space. You know this was uh, foundational for I mean a lot of what we uh, talk about, and that's you know in some of the ways we were talking about yeah. science fiction. And who knows uh, what they might mean for the future of yeah. humanity? But I mean it might be it might mean much more to the future of humanity than yeah. stuff that we think is so important today. You know, than a, than a presidential election or a, or a coronavirus or something like that. Those yeah. might be just tiny blips compared to the you know the, the building of understanding that that you know connects us to the stars and, and yeah. whatever futures out there, whether that's us moving or running into something or yeah, you know, it's knows? it's amazing to I mean this these were. Uh, missions that discovered you know they learned about like the the radiation fields uh, that Jupiter gives off, which is really yeah. interesting. I mean those are those are you know now that kind of stuff is fairly well understood uh, but that also is how we figured out that like io yeah, is a can, moon of confirm volcanoes. that even that planets even had these uh, yeah. magnetic fields which helps us understand quite a lot that's you know very practical application on earth yeah. but yeah we found we found whole moons and moons yeah. that are really interesting and moons that because they're really interesting teach us a lot more about the nature of matter and the universe and how things are created and those have practical application here on earth and they have an enormous theoretical application uh, and yeah. you, you know that we did that with this this chunk of metal. Yeah, and there's you know there's interesting stories on them. Essentially, you know the essentially the CIA had invented RTGs for spy <laughs> satellites. And they're like, oh, we don't know if these really work, so we'll give you three for free if you'll test yeah. them for us. You know, that's an I mean that's an amazing <laughs> story that it's a uh, and it's yeah. all and you're right that it's so connected to so many of these other things that were going on. Yeah, uh, and it, there's always these talks. I mean. Space space exploration has always had this enormous part of uh, budgetary constraints and how how much yeah. we want to spend on it. And of course, you know the scientists want to spend more <laughs> than the than the politicians are usually willing to spend. And then how to figure out uh, you know how much what we can do with what we have. Uh, that is, and the pioneer story. I mean, because uh, you know the pioneer one through nine had different purposes. Yeah, but essentially, when they were on a times crunch and a budget crunch. They took these pieces that that's not what they originally intended for, and they, you know, they looked at it like a tinker toy, and they turned that into yeah. a different kind of probe that had a whole different purpose. But I mean, most uh, every scientific instrument on there it was being reused from someplace that had been used before. And yeah, I mean, it's, every time it's an extraordinary story of what they did with with. Though I mean, it's funny because we think that things that are in the millions of dollars are shoestring budgets, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Obviously, you know, those of us in our own homes, that that's that that's a, that seems like an enormous amount of money. But I mean, on, yeah. on the aspect of trying to build something to go 
outside the solar system. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely amazing what they did. Yeah, yeah, right. And it's it, sometimes it's kind of amazing to think of all, all these millions of dollars are put into it. And then when you look at the actual device, it's this like spindly little little thing and you're like wow that's yeah. that cost it's a little thing it doesn't look like it could make you know it couldn't make it a day in traffic in los angeles right so, yeah I mean. yeah that's it's really just interesting to think about that kind of stuff and you and know I, I love how much they go beyond their missions we find that yeah. in the rovers the, the rovers that we talk about today i mean this you know long since supposed to have stopped working and now they're still running and uh, you know that these are you know these were intended to have six eight 18 month missions and 40 years later we're still getting data from them and it's amazing. You know, the, it's, it's just, uh, it's, they're just wonderful stories. This is, yeah. this is history that deserves to be remembered. Well, and we, we're still talking about, uh, you know, the rover we've got there now and the, the little helicopter, which they had lost yeah. contact with for a while because it was on the other side of a hill. And I, yeah. that's always, it's always really interesting to, to, I, I'm always excited to be like, oh, is it, is it going to work this time? And how much be, are yeah. we going to, and it's amazing to think that we've, you know, we've got this little remote control, uh, uh, RC car on Mars that has its own uh -huh. little helicopter, and we're just controlling it from from here and learning. And we all can't, kinds and yeah, of... we think we lose it, and it, you know, yeah. we find it again, and it keeps it just keeps going and going and going. Yeah, it's amazing, and th that we can do honestly, honestly, that we can do almost anything that we've done with them from this far away because something goes yeah. wrong, which has happened with multiple. I mean, there there have been a number of missions where one little thing goes wrong, and it's just yeah, and and it's lost. Yeah, it's completely yeah. lost. Yeah. Yeah, but we've. It's amazing what scientists can do when they uh, when they are able to. You know, they they're able to do so many different things to try to uh, keep these these little guys running, and they, they do get their own little like kind of character. It is, uh, it, well, you know, and that and that because we started to bring it full circle, talking about yeah. science and science fiction and how they tie together. But with what we're able to do with science, then you have to think a lot of what we've seen in science fiction is. You know, yeah. is and you know we're. We're talking about things like uh, artificial intelligence and stuff like that. That I mean, science fiction was talking about these as challenges, you know, decades ago yeah. because of uh, what we learned in things like, you know, our, our space probe programs. You know, science fiction is predicting this this, yeah. this present and the, and the questions that we have in this present. Uh, so, and yeah, it was just like uh, anything else, I don't know how this is all going to fit in, uh, in ten years or hundred years. You know, what are we going to say about this historically? I don't know. But I think there's a good, very good chance that in a hundred years we'll still be applying things that we learned from Pioneer Ten. Uh, while yeah. things that we think are very important today are, are you know, forgotten history. Have it's some the kind, the the kind of stuff guys. that you, and, yeah. you, you read about in the uh, the Chester Arthur biography kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, something <laughs> like that, yeah. <laughs> no, one else, no one else remembers it because, uh, you know, yeah, I, I yeah. always find yeah, that, I think I find they, that you know, those early Those early 21st yeah. century presidents that, you know, nothing happened and we don't really and, remember their names. And... <laughs> you're, you're lucky if anyone remembers yeah. anything about at, it. At what point is Barack Obama going to be Millard Fillmore? We, you know, <laughs> no or, one's going to yeah, Magellan no TV is sponsoring this episode. I sponsor all of our Name and if you've listened yeah, to the yeah, podcast, I mean, you know yeah, that what we like to do is talk about what we've been be. watching on Magellan uh, TV lately. Built on the science and so what have you been watching on Magellan from the little, TV? From the budget of, of you know, Pioneer 10 and 11, yeah. Yeah, there's only really so much to watch on Magellan TV. So we were clipping through, and we came to something in true crime. It's called the How to Catch a Serial Killer. Uh, but I mean, what the real story is is that there was a, there was a guy in England who kidnapped a girl, uh, and you know, uh, the police detective uh, operating on the idea that she's still alive uh, was able to sort of skirt some of the rules in terms of how you talk to uh, uh, suspects. Uh, because if you're trying to preserve a life, it's different. So uh, uh, without spoiling too much of it, it's a really interesting story about, you know, how far you're willing to push due process and criminal justice uh, to, you know, protect a life. Uh, and those are, you know, those are those are fascinating stories. I don't want to I don't want to spoil the ending. I mean, it's, it's great, but it is it, it really leaves you some very interesting kind of uh, ethical questions while also dealing with a very interesting you know criminal case and how they solve the criminal case. And he, uh, basically, the the entire point of the thing that I thought was so interesting was that, as far as he was concerned, until he found the body, until he knew exactly what happened, it was his responsibility, uh, totally, totally, to to, to, to to protect. He to, had to. So in the Schrodinger's cat, you had to assume the cat was alive until you could prove the cat uh, was dead. And, yeah. and and he just kept going and kept going. And so uh, certainly recommend it, although it, it kind of gives you a little shiver down the, you know. Yeah, it's called, uh, called How to Catch a Serial Killer. Yeah, it gives you a shiver in a, in a number of different places, you know, both who the guy is, but I mean, like, you know, say, you know, 
when are we trading our rights, our due process, our protection from police? Uh, when are we trading that for our public safety? Yeah. Uh, and this is really one of those, you know, one of those lines. You know, this was not an innocent guy that was beat into confessing. This is someone, you know, that uh, uh, that is a really terrifying person, and we're and we're having to decide, you know, how we which we value more. And that's it's really interesting. And it, you know, it just it just goes to that as, as a storyline. Hmm. So, how to catch a serial killer? Absolutely worth your time. Was uh, was a very fascinating watch. What are you watching, dear? What I watched, I was looking at a lot of stuff, of course, and, but the one that I want to talk about today is called From Hell to Heaven, When the Coal Mines Close. And I, I guess in a, a couple of these, you know, a couple of these recent episodes, I've watched watched these like European wildlife ones, because that's what this one is about. It's about this area of Germany in southeast Germany called Lusatia, which has, it's kind of a boggy land, but it's been uh, essentially just strip mined for, for decades. And so it's it's kind of looking at how these pockets of nature that have been there the whole time are adapting and kind of dealing with a, you know completely like moon landscapes where they've dug up just whole whole sections of the land. But it's it's really really cool to see all these various uh, I mean there's spiders and foxes and uh, all kinds of birds and fish and stuff like that. I think that to some extent you know we kind of think of Europe as is like a a denatured place. There's, they don't have really a lot of wild animals or anything like that, but it's it's interesting to see you know that, that there are places where it is still wild even in a place that's you know so oh, so modernized, yeah. and so uh, there's so many people living in Europe and it's so densely populated. That's a great story. I mean, actually, there's quite a few of those sorts of things in Magellan yeah. where you find. I mean, you know, we, I, you know, I guess this probably can happen anywhere. You know, when when it's a country you're not familiar with, but yeah. I do think that that's the American view that Europe is all cities and that yeah. they don't still have wild animals or wild places or wild parks, and that's not true at all. It's just yeah. fascinating. You know, yeah, very few people say I'm going to travel to France to go see the, you know, the the mountains. I mean, they're you know they're yeah. mostly traveling to see you know uh, the history and the cities and etc. Uh, and uh, so that's that, that's another one. Gosh, you always watch one that we will have to go watch after. Yeah, we'll just go downstairs and immediately see how many spiders there are in the, that part of Germany, for heaven's sake. <laughs> and of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. Next up, the History Guy tells the story of Voyager 2. In 1964, scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory noted that there would be a rare alignment of four planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, in the late 1970s that would give an unprecedented opportunity for a single spacecraft to explore more than one planet. NASA engineers began advocating for a program to build spacecraft to take advantage of this alignment and look at our solar system's outer planets in what they called the Grand Tour. That program would eventually become the Voyager program. Two extraordinary spacecraft that gave we Earthlings not only a better look at the outer planets of our solar system, but our first real look at what lay beyond. Well, Voyager 1 was the first of the pair to encounter one of those planets, going by Jupiter in 1979, and the first to enter interstellar space in 2012. Voyager 2 was actually the first of the probes to be launched, and was the first in to date only spacecraft to visit our solar systems to ice giants, Neptune and Uranus. The extraordinary odyssey of Voyager 2 is history that deserves to be remembered. The rare opportunity provided by the unique planetary alignment had to do with a then relatively new concept called gravity assist. NASA engineer Gary Flandro, who holds the Bowling Chair of Excellence in Space Propulsion at the University of Tennessee Space Institute, explained in a 1966 paper in the journal Acta Astronautica, Contrary to popular belief, indirect ballistic trajectories involving close approach to one or more intermediate planets need not require longer flight duration than is characteristic of direct transfer orbits. In fact, significant reduction of both required flight time and launch energy results if efficient use is made of the energy which can be gained during a mid-course planetary encounter. Simply put, Gravity Assist uses gravity of a planetary body to help slingshot a spacecraft, giving it acceleration. The technique can be used to not just speed the spacecraft, but to allow methods of speed and direction change that do not require fuel, which is normally in short supply on a spacecraft that must carry all the fuel it needs for speeding up, slowing down, changing direction, or stabilizing the spacecraft. 
Assuming the craft has no ability to acquire more fuel, the mission must be carefully planned within the confines of the amount of fuel the spacecraft can carry, called the Delta V budget. Delta V referring to the total energy needed for the spacecraft's change in velocity over the course of the mission. While the first theoretical papers discussing the concept were published in the 1920s and 30s, it wasn't until 1956 that Italian engineer Gitano Crocco calculated a mission that would use multiple gravity assists, proposing a one-year exploration trip, Earth, Mars, Venus, Earth. The method of gravity assist was used in 1959 by the Soviet Luna 3 spacecraft, the first to photograph the far side of the moon. The craft used the moon's gravity to change the direction of the spacecraft. But there's a significant limit to the use of gravity assist, and that is the planetary body or large mass whose gravity you intend to use has to be in the correct place in order to direct your spacecraft to where you want it to go. How often that occurs depends upon the mission. It might be years in between times when planets align in such a way that you can use them to help get your spacecraft from one particular spot to another, and the proposed NASA Grand Tour is a relatively extreme case. The particular alignment that will allow the use of gravity assist to the outer planets being proposed occurs just once, every 175 years. The same opportunity will not occur again until the middle 22nd century. This gave NASA a limited window of opportunity to get their craft together. The original NASA proposal was released in August 1969. They suggested two missions, each visiting three planets, including Pluto, still considered to be a planet at the time. One spacecraft would visit Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto, the other Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. They proposed using an entirely new spacecraft, tentatively called the Thermoelectric Outer Planet Spacecraft, or TOPS, being designed at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But the estimated cost was high, as much as a billion dollars, and the program had to compete with the new space shuttle program. Congress balked at the cost, and the mission had to be scaled back. Instead of an entirely new spacecraft, the missions would use one derived from the Mariner program, 10 spacecraft that had been launched between 1962 and 1973 to investigate Mars, Venus, and Mercury. Instead of the Grand Tour, two spacecraft would visit one planet each. This reduced the estimated cost to a more palatable $360 million per probe. But NASA was using a bit of an accounting trip because NASA was designing these two spacecraft with a mission life that would allow them to complete the originally envisioned Grand Tour, but only advertising visiting two planets, Saturn and Jupiter, in order to reduce the estimated mission costs. In 1977, the program was renamed Voyager. The probes would visit Jupiter, which had already been visited by Pioneer 10 and 11, and Saturn, which had been visited by Pioneer 11. In addition, the mission would allow a flyby investigation of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Voyager 1 would be optimized for a visit to Titan, although there was an alternative option to visit Pluto instead. Titan, after being photographed by Pioneer 11, seemed to be more interesting. The second spacecraft, Voyager 2, would have options. The spacecraft would fly by Jupiter and Saturn, but could then continue to Uranus and Neptune. However, if Voyager 1 had not completed its objectives in its exploration of Titan, Voyager 2 could instead be redirected for another investigation of that moon instead of visiting the two ice giants. The two identical spacecraft would use three-axis stabilization and a central parabolic antenna for communication. Attitude control was provided by 16 hydrazine fuel thrusters, and electrical power was provided by radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs. RTGs convert the heat released by the decay of radioactive material to generate electricity. This particular RTG designed for the Voyager program was the Multi-Hundred Watt Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generator, or MHW, RTG, which produced 157 watts of electrical power initially, and having that every 87.7 years. The craft carried 11 scientific instruments, and each also included a gold-plated copper golden record phonograph record that includes sounds and images intended to portray the diversity of life on Earth, and that, the hope is, could be deciphered by any intelligent civilization that might encounter the craft. In all, the Voyager spacecraft weighed 1,704 pounds, or 105 kilograms. Because of their different trajectories, Voyager 2, using a longer circular trajectory aimed at the grand tour of the four giants, was launched before Voyager 1. Voyager 1 was optimized to visit Jupiter and Saturn and Titan, this plan allowed flexibility and redundancy. By launching Voyager 2 first, NASA had the option to redirect Voyager 1 to the Grand Tour if the first launch failed. And as Voyager 2 would not reach Saturn until nine months after Voyager 1, there would be ample time to redirect Voyager 2 to Titan if Voyager 1 was not able to meet its mission objectives there. Voyager 2 was launched using a Titan 3 Centaur launch vehicle, a rocket that married the upper stage of a Centaur rocket 
to a Titan III rocket. The more than 1.3 million pound or 637,000 kilogram rocket produced 5,339 kilonewtons of thrust. Spacecraft was launched from Space Launch Complex 41 in Cape Canaveral, Florida on August 20th, 1977, two weeks ahead of Voyager 1. Both launches were successful, but a near fatal complication arose with Voyager 2 in April. The main radio receiver failed. The backup was functional, but a capacitor in it also failed. This meant that NASA had to communicate on a precise frequency, which was then affected by a number of factors. NASA engineers were forced to calculate the necessary frequency needed for each transmission to the probe. The ability to continue its mission was a testament both to the value of redundant systems and the ability of engineers to adapt to unexpected challenges. Voyager 2's close approach to Jupiter came in July 1979. Using its less circular trajectory, Voyager 1 had made its closest approach in January. While Voyager 1's closer approach to the planet allowed greater image resolution, it gave a relatively short window to the gas giant's moons, rings, and magnetic field. Voyager 2 did not fly as close to the planet, but its trajectory allowed a greater investigation of Jupiter's Jovian moons. The flyby also allowed a comparison of observations between the two probes, allowing scientists to, for example, confirm the eruption of volcanoes that had been observed by Voyager 1 on Jupiter's moon Io, the first time an active volcano was observed on a celestial body other than Earth. Voyager 2's closer observations of the moon Europa led to speculation that the moon is composed of water ice. Voyager 2 also identified three previously unknown moons and the system's largest planet. Voyager 1 flew by Saturn the following November, 1980. Its flyby of Titan met all its mission objectives, freeing Voyager 2 to continue with the grand tour. Voyager 2 started its encounter with Saturn in August, 1981, and was able to use its antenna to take measurements of the planet's atmospheric pressure and density, as well as taking more photos of Saturn's moons. There was a brief issue with the probe's photography platform that endangered the rest of the mission, but NASA engineers were able to correct the problem. And while Voyager 1 headed off to deep space, Voyager 2 would be the first, and so far only, spacecraft to visit the Uranium system, which its closest approach occurring in January 1987, where it discovered 10 moons, two new rings, before heading to Neptune. At the time, because of Pluto's elliptical orbit, Neptune was the farthest known body in the solar system. Like Uranus, Voyager 2 is the only probe to have directly explored Neptune, where it confirmed six new moons and four previously unidentified rings. NASA explains that the planet was not quite what scientists expected. The planet itself was found to be more active than previously believed, with 680 mile or 1,100 kilometer per hour winds. Hydrogen was found to be the most common atmospheric element, although the abundant methane gave the planet its blue appearance. The close flyby of the planet allowed an understanding of the ice giant that could not be achieved using Earth-based observation. It was Voyager 2 that identified the large anticyclonic storm that makes up the planet's great dark spot, called GDS 89, very similar to Jupiter's red spot and Saturn's great white spot. The encounter with Neptune was considered to be the end of Voyager's 2 original mission. NASA reported that through the end of the Neptune phase of the Voyager project, a total of $875 million had been expended for the construction, launch, and operations of both Voyager spacecraft. Of their mission to the outer planets, Arizona State University planetary scientist Jim Bell told Scientific American in 2015, they were revolutionary. The Voyagers discovered many moons around the planets we never knew were there, and even the ones we knew were there were literally just points of light and telescopes before that. All of a sudden they changed to geologic objects, to worlds that had weather and volcanoes and tectonics. It was just night and day. And then, just like its sibling, Voyager 2 headed off into the vast unknown, and the mission was renamed the Voyager Interstellar Mission. The spacecraft passed through the heliopause, which marks the boundary between matter originating from the sun and matter originating from the rest of the galaxy, thus putting Voyager 2 in interstellar space on November 5th, 2018, more than six years after its faster sibling did. A fact sheet provided by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory explains, had the Voyager mission ended after the Jupiter and Saturn flybys alone, it still would have provided the material to rewrite astronomy textbooks. But having doubled their already ambitious itineraries, the Voyagers return to Earth information over the years that has revolutionized the science of planetary astronomy, helping to resolve key questions while raising intriguing new ones about the origin and evolution of the planets in our solar system. After providing enormous amounts of information about the outer planets, both Voyager 1 and 2 continue to transmit data, giving new information and detecting some scientific surprises about the nature of the heliopause and interstellar space. 
As they travel, they encounter challenges, and the plutonium powering their batteries slowly decays. And as it does, various instruments are shut down, but Voyager 2 still has five scientific instruments operational, according to NASA. The two craft are moving in different directions, allowing them to collect data not just on interstellar space, but to compare data between the two locations. A 2019 edition of National Geographic quoted Princeton University postdoctoral researcher Jamie Rankin. We have been interstellar travelers since Voyager 1 crossed, but now Voyager 2's cross is even more exciting because we can now compare two very different locations in the interstellar medium. A 2020 discovery of a new kind of solar electron burst prompted Iowa Today to proclaim, more than 40 years since they were launched, the Voyager spacecraft are still making discoveries. The Voyager mission is now the longest running and most distant space mission in history. Last year, the only antenna on Earth, Australia's Deep Space Station 43, that is capable of communicating with Voyager 2, had to be taken down for renovation and repairs. While scientists could still receive data from Voyager 2, they could not send instructions for more than eight months. But when the antenna was repaired enough to send instructions, after the longest pause in the program's history, Voyager 2 responded, without incident, still soldiering on more than 44 years after being launched. Astronomy Magazine noted in 2020 that both should be able to keep at least one scientific instrument running until 2025. And even after that, NASA expects to continue receiving engineering data from the probes until 2035, when they will exceed the range of the Deep Space Network antennas. The importance of the Voyager program is profound, both in terms of the science gained and in terms of the meaning of the accomplishment of sending an object made by humans so far from home. Thomas Zaberchin, Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters in Washington, D.C., said in a statement in August 2017, I believe that few missions can ever match the achievements of the Voyager spacecraft during their four decades of exploration. They have educated us to the unknown wonders of the universe and truly inspired humanity to continue to explore our solar system and beyond. A 2017 edition of the magazine Futurism put it simply, NASA's twin Voyager probes are the most important spacecraft ever launched. So the first thing I want to talk about with Voyager is I feel like it would be a, a disservice to my own nerd cred if I didn't mention V'ger. Uh, from the, sure, yes. possibly the worst Star Trek movie, but, uh, but yeah, I, well, yeah, Star Trek the movie. So yeah, and uh, they don't really make it clear which Viger it is, and the thing at the end does not look like either of the Voyagers. No, uh, I, I was the, the, I was the, looking it, it up. It's more like like a Apollo yeah. Know, capsule. Yeah, they. I was looking it up, and it's not even clear when it would have been launched. But something mentioned that it was supposed to be Voyager Six, which uh, of course we didn't launch oh, of Voyager yeah, the time 6. they thought we were going to continue the Voyager program. Yeah, yeah that's doesn't, kind of interesting. Yeah. I was trying to look into that, if there had been a plan that we were going to, you know, if there had even been the plan for a Voyager 3. And it doesn't really look It is. Like the, the, it. That episode, too, for all the geeks out there, um, yeah. that episode was based on an actual episode of the original series where there was a yeah. space probe. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of interesting that they took that spin on it. But, yeah, yeah I, the, uh, the idea, though, because, I mean, it touches to, you know, stuff we were talking about earlier in the episode, too, is how science fiction and science facts, how they tie together together and etc that you know if if we think of how star trek uh, inspired scientists yeah uh, this is how scientists inspired star trek yeah uh, and you know it's kind of funny that they did that play where you know there was i don't know a piece of dirt on it so you couldn't read the whole name and so yeah. they, they're thinking beecher is some sort of person only to find out that it's a voyager probe but i mean what a fascinating idea uh, if the voyagers if one of them bumped into some you know intelligent species uh, who then picked on to that intelligent species and yeah. is using that, uh, you know, as, uh, if that comes back to haunt us in some way. It's it's a really interesting, and I mean, that's it's science fiction too. And so, of course, you know, there's, there's <laughs> stuff that it's inspired by science and then there's uh, really kind of totally fantasy <laughs> elements to it. I, <laughs> And that's I, I think that's something I enjoy about uh, science. Certainly, you can have a long discussion about how yeah. how realistic Star Trek really is. <laughs> I don't know, but I mean that idea that uh, that I mean, if if the whole idea of V'ger in Star Trek the movie, if that wasn't real, then why did we strap that plaque or that uh, yeah. that record onto him? I mean, you know, clearly we were anticipating the real possibility that intelligent yeah. life could find that and find some meaning and come back. Yeah. And so it leaves the question of what would that be like? I don't know if it would be like a big space feature, you know. <laughs> Who knows? 
I, and that's kind of, I mean, I think that's what's part of what's exciting about it is that, you know, you can just imagine uh, yeah. whatever scenario for this stuff. Well, I do. If you're, if you're writing science fiction, but I mean, sometimes yeah. science fiction might be science fact. Yeah. And, and you know, we, what if what if someone flies up and says, hey, we found this, uh, you know, so what are you, think it's what, what are you asking of us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you, you, seem well, to, a... you seem to make us think that we want to know who you are and where you are. So here we are. What do you want to, what do you want to know? <laughs> I do wonder, you know, I wonder with this, uh, some people have uh, criticized, you know, the whole, the whole concept of the golden record with this idea that, you know, sending something out and saying, ah, oh, this is where we are. We don't know if whatever's going to find it is going to yeah, be there know, was some violent or vicious that. or... I, they're just going to be like, oh, well, here's the place that to is, That is an interesting philosophical question. Yeah. That is, and, you know, did did the United States have the right to, you know, put the planet at risk in such a way? But on the other hand, if, if there's intelligent life out there, do we really not want it to find us? Yeah. Uh, but it's funny because in the science fiction milieu, uh, uh, far more frequently <laughs> they are hostile. Yeah. <laughs> and friendly. <laughs> and we said, oh. There's a much greater chance they'll come here with poor intention yeah. rather than good intention. And they don't think we're going to run into Vulcans. They're going to come and say, you know, live long and prosper. We think they're going to come yeah. here and I, eat our brains or whatever, steal our women. I, I do feel like the Golden Record, you know, it's got all these really interesting stuff that we decided to, you know, put on it. And it's got like people speaking in different languages and sounds mm -hmm. of animals. I, I, it is interesting to wonder, you know, what an alien would think of all that information yeah. uh, if they would have any way to I, well part of that's a question because we really don't know how yeah. universal anything will be we don't know that if life uh, evolves somewhere else if it's going to look like us uh and yeah. if it does you know i mean if maybe the the coincidence that led to humanity uh are the sorts of coincidences that would have to occur in order yeah. to, and so maybe they'll pick that up and say oh this makes total sense uh or maybe you know it'll be a giant space blob and you know it has no idea what music yeah. is so yeah yeah it's but to, the whole idea of trying to sit and say, if we're going to do our best based on a guess uh, to produce something that would be our introduction to something that would see Voyager and know that it was, you know, something other than a rock, right? Yeah. Uh, then, you know, what would we want to do? And, you know, we put together some of the most amazing minds on the planet. And then we, we actually, with the record, we, you know, we, we looked all over the world for the messages to yeah. send. That's really pretty extraordinary, but you're right. I mean, the, the, the odds that that will ever run into anything are, you know, unbelievably small. I mean, yeah. uh, probably immeasurably small. It'd probably be impossible to try to calculate because we don't have any idea how common anything is. Yeah. And then the odds that if you found that that, 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 you know, if it actually ran into something that they would know what the heck that record is or yeah. make any sense of it. I don't even know. know how to make sense of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or maybe. even if you think about the fact that maybe they've already said something over here, we just didn't recognize it. Or, or maybe they'll be mad and say, we invented rock yeah. and roll long before you. What yeah, you it's, it, but it's, it, that is part of the, you know, it's this idea, it's, there's, there's something very human about our desire to like, and, and very optimistic. Yeah. I feel like it's a, it's a good part of humanity that we're like it we is, want to share yeah. this with you. But but like uh, like Patty Joe said, I don't know. Uh, we don't we don't know what on earth they how they think or uh, if they could have. They, they, they might not even see uh, the way we see. In human history, an awful lot of people have gotten in a boat without knowing any more than yeah. that. Yeah, you know? that's and, true. Uh, and 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 you know a lot of those never came home. Yeah. Hopefully, you know we won't die of scurvy out in space. But uh, I mean, there's an awful lot of people who who uh, went into the unknown. Uh, just because it was unknown, and they went with the hope that you know they would speak your language enough that you know you could uh, you could interact, yeah. or trade, or earn, or I guess take from them because you know often <laughs> that's imperialist. But uh, so I, I mean, there is apparently something in human nature uh, that that is the part of the reason that, and you know, Carl Sagan drove a lot of that. But I mean, is the reason that we felt that it was so necessary if we're going to build this thing that goes that far to save some little bit of the space on that very limited space, you know, vehicle. Yeah. Uh, to to say you know uh, it's it's really like just calling out and saying hey we're people that made this and we made yeah. it this far uh, and you know if it comes you know if Viger comes floating back to us you know maybe we'll pay the consequences or maybe I don't know it'll try to talk if we're going to go through Star maybe we we'll want to talk to the whales or something that was you know if we're, <laughs> we're talking Star Trek or I, you know, I don't yeah Darth Vader ship is still floating around after and and you know this will show them how to get home who knows what it's going to be. Uh, uh, and I mean, you know, there's so many different you know versions in science fiction, but I mean, uh, what if we think going to the moon was a great human accomplishment? Then you know, what would be you know getting our message to someone else be? And so it was worth, yeah. I guess, it's worth a try. I mean, it's it's funny because the same sort of people that built that record are the same sort of people who would tell you that it's mathematically stupid to buy a lottery ticket. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, that the, the, there's no chance, and yet we we still did it. Yeah, just yeah. To, your, just your chance case. of getting the Powerball numbers are much greater than the chance that anything that's yeah. going to ever pick up that record and play it and know what it means. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you know, uh, Voyager 2 is such an interesting one. I, I did want to ask, uh, Voyager 2 is pretty before my time, but both mm -hmm. of you were around when uh, Voyager yes. 2 was launched, and so I yeah. wanted to ask you if you guys had any memories of it. Yeah, I mean, I certainly remember it being on the news. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's as much as, as I remember. No, that's as much, too. You know, and at the time, we were seeing one right thing right after another yeah. after another and not realizing that... Um, uh, um, so much that each one was so individual and were advancing that it's further. Yeah, I, part of the story. We're still just astonished that it was going on. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, uh, I don't know. I don't remember specifically that. I just remember that it was it was a constant part of, of yeah. the realization that that we were doing things that were just absolutely astonishing. But that was very that history very that middle I space lived race. through. Um, I learned uh, writing that episode. I learned lots of things I didn't know even having lived through it. Yeah, uh, and uh, this and there's a lot of things that are amazing about the mission. But you know, the whole idea of why they timed when they sent one and when they sent two, and so that they could repurpose them so they achieved their missions in this way or that way, uh, and that you know that whole idea, which was really quite brilliant. I mean, the whole yeah. thing was very very well coordinated on how they could use the two. I don't I don't recall that at the time at all. Yeah. Uh, and it's so funny to look back now, you know, however, you know, now when you look back, things you thought were huge or much smaller when you go see them and all that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that if you looked at the technology on Voyager, it would look like, you know, something, you know, vintage retro, you know, that yeah. you would buy a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, but at the time, that was just like, whew, you know, and, yeah. uh, and you know, that, that to keep talking to them, they have to keep these antique computers running, you know. And, yeah, that's and, amazing because that they, yeah. they can't even get them to... To talk with yeah. the new computers. Yeah, with the new computer, and you know that whole idea that they had so little computer memory space that they could, you know, they had to had to build them to be able to uh, do most of the uh, of it robotically, yeah. and just send a few messages, and you know, to try because you you imagine that now because now we can, you know, uh, you got that a thumbnail drive that's got you know millions yeah. of times more information. So, I, I, and but at the time, you know, this was just wow. But I mean, also at the time, and I was also there. I remember when they lost the Mars probe because they had a, you know, they had a translation yeah. error between millimeters and and and, and inches, and and uh, uh, or when uh, you know with the Hubble telescope went out. I don't know how people remember when the Hubble telescope went up. Thing didn't work, or much of it didn't work. I mean, that's not fair to say, but that was a big chunk of it that didn't work because, and then they had to go up and fix. They eventually fixed with the space shuttle, and, uh, well, that and was amazing. Uh, you know, and you know, I remember how amazing the space shuttle was now, and that, now that's a long retired program that's you know, yeah. mostly an antique. You know, that all uh, it's it's uh, that gives you a perspective saying I was here and I remember when they launched Voyager and now you're looking at Voyager 50 years later. Uh, yeah. you know, th that tells you something about your life. Whew. But, uh, uh, you know, well, you know, Josh is my son and Josh has a daughter. Now I'm a grandpa now. And you know, so uh, the history certainly moves on. Uh, but uh, it's it's really cool to watch something that was so amazing. So science fiction, so cutting edge and to be able to look at it in retrospect like this. Yeah. And it really makes you think, you know, what's it going to mean when when you're my age or when Violet is my age and, you know, what's, what's she going to be seeing because uh, of what, you know, we've managed to see. I wonder about it. And I wonder, you know, when the next time I, we don't see, we've kind of changed, you know, our goals and what we're doing with sending space probes and stuff. Uh, yeah, but, but we're still sending them up there. Oh, we yeah. Are. And, and I wonder, know, we'll, I wonder we'll what we'll talk ways... about those in retrospect, you know, someday too. Well, and the fact that we're, we're getting, we're getting into, uh, uh, into a whole different era where, where it's, 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 Private, not so much, yeah. not so much the government, the private thing, which is fascinating too, to because uh, because you have to th you have to think these people are, are going to be successful in some of this, yeah. and so uh, and maybe that's the way that we need to go is that it's it's done through private enterprise or so forth. It's really interesting, and I mean I think it's amazing that you know Voyager two is the only. Uh, the only probe we've sent that's that's actually really investigated Uranus, and that's uh, that's just a really interesting uh, uh, piece of history. That's something I didn't know that we've mm -hmm. only sent the one, and it that it, that otherwise you know we've we've everything we've learned has been from a distance. And I wonder, I mean, at some point maybe we're gonna you know try to do more research like that. On the other hand, like Voyager two, you know, actually uh, escaping the the helio the heliopause before the pioneers. Um, because it just moved so much faster. I wonder, you know, we talk about who's who might find Voyager two, but maybe we're going to go end up picking it up at some point because uh, we're we're going to have advanced so far that we can catch up to it before anyone else could could ever find it. <laughs> <laughs> and I I wonder what that because we apparently know at least with some some pretty decent accuracy where Voyager two is at the moment, and that's uh, that's an amazing thing. It's amazing that Voyager two is still giving us data, and that we're you know we're still hearing something. From a little, you know, this little, uh, not exactly a robot, but at least a, 
this thing that we sent out all that long time ago. And it, it really does. It's kind of sad to think about that, you know, eventually that nothing else will be working on it and it'll just be a flying piece of space junk uh, after it has given so much to, to our knowledge. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.